Hi everyone, I'm Jack from Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I wanted to continue the library tour in this video by focusing on a shelf of crime. We are at the very end of March Mystery Madness after all. And these are two of my all time favorite series, even though they come from a subgenre of crime fiction that I generally don't gravitate towards. Usually I'm pulling spy fiction off the shelves, private detective novels, nearly nihilistic noir as I like to describe it. And these are police procedurals. Usually I find police procedurals to be very formulaic. Um, they're almost like the TV dinners of books or, or crime fiction, you know, consume it as quickly as possible and get it out of your system. Uh, but these these series work. Uh, they're two of my favorites. My wife loves these books as well. And that's because even though they're police procedurals and, and they are crime novels, they're a series of books that span a decade. Span a decade of life in Sweden, and you might be identifying already what both of these uh, series are, but they span a decade of life in Sweden and they show how society is changing how the world at large is changing, how police investigations change across those 10 years. And, and we see characters grow up, we see children grow up, we see couples separate or divorce, we see parents pass away. We see all of these different changes that fill in all of these details and make the worlds uh, that these two series craft feel very lived in. Um, they, they amass the, the authenticity and details that we often praise 19th century, um, you know, those really long 19th century novels for. That, that those details exist in these. They also happen to be incredibly well written, uh, incredibly socially conscious, and they're great, great crime novels. I'm talking, of course, about, and they, they look stunning on the shelves, the uh, fantastic Kurt Wallander books from Henning Mankell, just a wonderful series of colors on the spines here, and what is undoubtedly, I think, my favorite. And I've mentioned them multiple times, the incredible Martin Beck series, written by the wife and husband team of writers, uh, Mass uh, Cyril and um, Per uh, Walur. So these books are fantastic. So I'll, I'll mention the Martin Beck series first. The um, Kurt Wallander books span from the very early 1990s through the early 2000s. The Beck books span from 1965 to 1975. And so we start with Rosanna. And this is a book that uh, is a very slow burn as a crime novel. I think, in fact, that in some ways it's the weakest Martin Beck book because part of it is spent just sort of laying out different characters. Who is Beck's investigative team? Um, who is he? You know, who, who is his wife? Who are his, his family members? Because uh, Cyril and, and, and Waller are going to then sort of take the playground they build and just move pieces around and, and do all sorts of interesting, interesting things in the subsequent nine novels. Um, Roseanne is the, t the titular character is the name of, of initially an unknown victim, a young woman who's found, um, her body's found in a, in a river. They don't know who she is. They don't know when she died. They don't know where she's from. And slowly details are pieced together and amassed um, to solve the crime. But really this is a book that's setting up the series. And The Man Who Went Up in Smoke is fascinating because this is a book uh, that sort of expands the world. While Rosanna um, deals with uh, the U.S. <laughs> in some ways, The Man Who Went Up in Smoke is a fascinating book because it starts to sh show the, uh, shine a light onto various nations from Eastern Europe and seeing how those nations uh, would interact with Sweden or with the world at large. And so the world expands in this book. And I think this is one of the strongest books, I think, in the series uh, among the early like three or four. Man on the Balcony is another incredible book. Um, this one is a more chilling, uh, much darker, I think, than the first two. The, the first two sort of have a, you know, uh, a young woman who was murdered and then the second one, a guy who's disappeared. Here we have the deaths of children. And the, the, as the crimes feel more vicious and more awful, um, we start to get at the humanity of, of some of the, the police team. We, the, you know, people start to take shape in new ways. Only for the laughing policeman to sort of blow up that world. Um, there's now violence, uh, a, a much, the scale of, of violence um, grows in this book. It affects the team of investigators. Um, and I think this is really the one where the this I just fell in love with the series. The first three I had found really interesting and compelling. This one, I, I certainly was like, okay, I'm reading all of them now. Fire Engine That Disappeared is a strange one. This is the only one I don't have in the same cool uh, covers. But this one is, is uh, strange because there's there are murders, but there's also uh, arson. 
involved. And so there's this, um, there, there's this sense of trying to involve the members of the team on a deeper level of the investigative team. It's not just Beck trying to work the case uh, as it was in some of the earlier novels. It felt that way at least. Here we have a number of his team, uh, the, the detectives on his team working in concert uh, to a much larger degree, I think. And this one really works. Great book. Murder at the Savoy is interesting. I think because in part, um, we, we have a very famous figure is publicly murdered. And, you know, the, it, it evokes all of, the, um, all of the tragedy that was felt with the numerous assassinations across the 1960s uh, and then into the 1970s. And, and uh, Cyril and, and Waller really tapped into that. And that idea of, you know, the, the violence in the other books was directed at regular people. And here it's at a very public figure. And how, how is that investigation going to be different? And I think this book has been very influential on um, Joe Nesbo and, and Henning Nunkel as well. The Abominable Man, again, we have a, uh, the, the books do tend to get a little bit darker as the series goes on. The Locked Room. Uh, this one is is interesting because it presents, uh, along with the fire engine that disappeared, sort of the dual mystery motif that Henning Mankell will explore in a number of his books, where there are different crimes that occur, and this is something a new number of crime fiction writers will work on, uh, different crimes that occur that, you know, there's this sense that perhaps they're related. And uh, so this one involves um, a bank robbery <laughs> in addition to the other crimes um, and, and a murder. So... Again, very strong, strong work. Cop Killer. Uh, and we're getting towards the end of, um, of the series now. And sadly, uh, Pero uh, Walu would uh, pass away in 1975. And the way they wrote the books was fascinating. They alternated chapters. So they plotted out what was going to happen. And then the, you know, the wife would write a chapter. The husband would write a chapter. The wife would write the next chapter. The husband would write the next chapter. And they did that for a decade. And it was marvelous. Um, but with, uh, with Cop Killer, we move out to an, in, uh, an investigation in a rural area, which sort of references, um, the very first, uh, Kurt Wallander book, Faceless Killers. He was heavily influenced by this series in all the best ways. And so this book, uh, sort of evokes some of the ideas from The Laughing Policeman, but shifts the center. Again, as, as the series goes on, we see how we see the relationships between how uh, Beck and, and his team and his family view the violence and, and how society is shifting across those 10 years. And ultimately we end with the terrorists. Um, you know, th this is a book that pays off all nine of the previous books. The, the seeds that were laid in Rosanna, the, the characters that were developed across the books, what ultimately occurs in the terrorists uh, is, is unexpected, it's shocking. And it, it's an incredibly compelling end to the series. Now, some 15-ish years later, Henning Munkel decided he had a police procedural <laughs> character he wanted to go with. Now, a, a key difference is that while the Beck mysteries um, in, involve Stockholm to a large degree, and as I mentioned, other, other parts of Sweden, other parts of Europe even, uh, there, there is sort of a central aspect to Stockholm throughout many of the books. That's not the case in the Wallander books, which are set in southern Sweden, um, almost really across uh, from Denmark in a lot of ways, in, in Mamo and in Istad. And so Faceless Killers uh, kicks off. And this is a book that's incredibly relevant today, even though it was written in 1990 or 1991, sort of right after the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, as, you know, Eastern Europe seemed to be um, opening up. Uh, there, this is a book that deals with a murder in a rural community. And the only clue they have is that the, the um, older woman who was murdered, uh, the last word she says is foreigner. And it deals with the, you know, the refugee population that's nearby and how, how that's um, interacting within the society. And again, it's incredibly relevant 30 years later, sadly relevant 30 years later, but this is a very solid start to the series. Dogs of Riga, I feel it's almost this like spiritual homage to uh, a book like The Man Who Went Up in Smoke. And this is, uh, on in my initial reading through the series, this was probably my single favorite one. Uh, I thought 
the the different characters who are um, introduced, particularly uh, a widow who's introduced in this book, was an incredibly interesting character. And Wallander has, a, you know, his family life is very different from Martin Beck's. Martin Beck's family seems to sort of have it together to a certain degree. And even though they're not always happy, there there is this sense of um, contentment. You know, they're, they're at least, there's a hope for fulfillment. And with, by the time we reach Wallander, uh, there have been social changes and you know the the first book really picks up where his marriage has just ended um and the third book is the white lioness and this book on my initial reading i thought it was really busy there was a little too much going on it's a little bit longer and while um Mankell's books would get longer but it's also a book that i think really starts to push on the ideas of social justice that henning Mankell would um introduce in a number of his books he was very politically active, and he wrote about those issues. He wrote those issues into uh, his crime novels as as sort of a um, an aspect that he pays attention to. Uh, as I think more and more about this book, I think it was also perhaps was influenced by The Day of the Jackal, which is one of my all-time favorite books, also one of my all-time favorite movies. And so I want to reread it kind of with that in mind. Um, but the ways in which the, the crimes and, and sort of conspiracies that are involved unravel are, are really fascinating and knowing that this book was written in the early 90s uh, if you're aware of what was going on in South Africa that becomes a key plot throughout this book. We have The Man Who Smiled in which a uh, there's a seemingly random uh, murder at the very beginning and this one feels a little more straightforward particularly after um, The White Lioness and how expansive that book was. I think with The Man Who Smiled uh, Mankell wanted to refocus and have a more like um, clear-cut crime novel. There's still, of course, questions around um, capitalism, wealth, cronyism at, at play in this book, uh, but it's it's more straightforward than The White Line is. There's not dueling narratives and such. Um, sidetracked. <coughs> this one has a very uh, horrifying beginning. And if if uh, you've ever seen the Kurt Wallander series um, that I believe the BBC did, I know PBS uh, aired it here in the US, with um, Kenneth Branagh as Kurt Wallander. Uh, this episode is, is brutal, um, and this book is quite brutal, uh, but it's, it's a strong one. It, it ultimately, the, the nature of the crime that is revealed, I think gets back to what Mankell really wants to explore. He's a crime novelist, but he's very much um, exploring social justice like at his heart. He's, he's more interested in that than in uh, than in the cr necessarily the crimes of his crime fiction. The crime fiction is a vehicle to explore those ideas within society and, and the ways um, that, that we have sort of that root of violence. And Sidetrack certainly, I think, gets back on that track. Uh, the Fifth Woman, um, again, has, has a more global, expansive view. And Sidetrack does as well uh, with, with sort of the, the Europe and, and the world. But um, I think the fifth woman really starts to expand that world even more. We have um, a, a crime in Africa, for example, that, that really um, we're, we're not just in Istad and um, uh, southern Sweden the way we were in Faceless Killers, for example. Uh, but this is a very solid one. One step behind a... <laughs> uh, a, little, a little more focused again, less sprawling. But a little more focused, we have a group of um, teens and who, who are involved um, and they're murdered at the very beginning. And then Wallander, of course, is brought in and investigating. And uh, this is, um, you know, that Mankell sort of operates on this oscillation between having these really global crime novels and ones that are a little more focused. Firewall. Uh, we have, th this one's interesting, I think, because of how much just technology has changed in the roughly 20 years since it was written. But this one uh, deals with technology to a large degree in a way that, of course, we never really saw in Martin Beck books. And it wasn't necessarily critical in the early Wallander books either. But with the advent of ATMs, of the internet, of all sorts of um, technology systems uh, permeating our world, uh, Firewall becomes, it really explores that idea and does it very well. 
Uh, before the Frost, we now have, you'll notice this is a Linda, a Kurt and Linda Wallander novel. Linda is initially introduced as Kurt Wallander's daughter in the first book, and she's, um, you know, in and out of his life. She's in and out of, you know, Sweden, even. Um, and he, he she, she's sort of trying to find her place in the world. And gradually, she becomes closer and closer with her father. And uh, this, this book is fairly strong. It, it brings her forward as a character in a way that um, pays off the, the roles she's had in the earlier books. Up next, two non- oh, I should mention The Pyramid, which is a series of stories uh, that are, are short stories, really. Long, I should say long stories that uh, Mankell published. And these are, some of these are early Kurt Wallander mysteries, but they were written much later on. They're, they're prequels to a certain degree. And they explore who was this guy before we were, we were introduced to a roughly 40-year-old detective um, who had, you know, become a police officer at 18. Return of the Dancing Master is fantastic. It's probably my single favorite Mankell book. Um, and one that doesn't have Kurt Wallander, but does... Um, explore the legacy of uh, fascism and Nazism within Sweden in, in a very effective way and in a horrifying way, but utterly compelling. And then The Man from Beijing, a sprawling book, um, <laughs> multiple crimes that are decades apart, continents apart, and one, uh, not a Kurt Wallander book, but one where Mankell again was really taking that scope and, and just exploring as much as he could of the world and the ways in which um, Crime is an aspect of any human society, sadly. So these are some of my favorites. These are uh, three, I should say, of my favorite writers and books that I reread frequently. I'd be curious to know if you've read any of these, uh, the entries from these series, if you have any favorites, uh, you know, or if there are other, um, other writers that you find compare well with them. So have a good one, everybody. Thanks.